Hi everyone, it's Dr. Suter. I am just waiting for Dr. Doring to, to join. Um, she's just finishing up a meeting. I'm sure she'll be here any minute. In the meantime, feel free to let me know if you can hear me and where you're from and um, you know whatever you wanna say, <laughs> just type it into the comments. And we're also waiting for some people to come. Um, and I will also um, connect uh, my the live here to some uh, Facebook groups. Um, so give me one second and we will be here and get started. Now a lot of people are joining right now. So I'm just gonna wait a little bit longer for people to show up. I hope you guys can all hear me. Um, please let me know, that'd be great. I'm just doing a little cross-linking here, sharing with a few other groups and a couple of other pages here um, so that everybody can join in. All right, here we go, almost done with that. And then uh, there was one more thing I wanted to do. Um, I have a few links for you guys just so that you can um, connect with me, find some of my books and things like that. So I'm just adding it right here. There we go. All right, now let me go back to be live and see if she's coming. Hi, everyone. Hi, Lois. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for being here. Um, Gail. Uh, Tracy. Oh, hi, Tracy. <laughs> I hope Lisa's going to join. Tracy is um, related. Hi, Carol. Hi, Kim. Hi, Glenda. So nice to see you guys all. I'm still waiting for Dr. Doring. She's not quite here yet. Um, I'm sure she'll be here any minute. But it's so good to see you guys all. I don't know how it is in your neighborhoods, where you're from, but we have snow and it keeps on piling and no sight of of summer coming, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it's sad, but um, that too shall pass. I'm certainly looking forward to some warmer weather. Hey, Angelo, Annette, Lauren, Tiffany. Lisa, Colleen, Denise, hi, it's all, it's nice to see all of you guys. And um, yeah, feel free to start um, posting some of your questions into the comment section um, if you have any. Um, that way we can be prepared uh, for those. Um, but we do have a lot of talking points here that we want to go through. Um, dental care is, is very important and near and dear to my heart and also Dr. Doring's heart. So we're gonna dive in and, and you know, work it. Um, hi, Hannah. Hi, Michelle. Uh, getting a bad storm here in Ohio. Yeah, we're supposed to get what, like 13 inches or something. <laughs> oh, well, I'll see it. I'll believe it when I see it um, because, you know, so many times they're wrong, these weather people. Um, yeah, if they had to pay for every time they're wrong, we'd all be really wealthy. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna just um, send a little text to Dr. Dory and see what's happening. Maybe she's having an issue um, logging in. Um, I'm not sure, or maybe I'm not seeing her. Let me just double check. Hold on a second, guys, and thanks for being patient. Nothing yet. And yeah, thanks for posting the questions. We'll get to all of those. Hello, Josie. Nice to see you and Kevin. And Linda, hello. All right. Um, not sure if I'm missing something here. Let me just see if she's here and I'm just not seeing her. I'm not sure. No, I don't think so. Let me double check here. Send her an invite. There's always some technical things happening, but maybe she just um, still stuck in her meeting. I'm not sure. Anyways, um, 
Let me just introduce myself in the meantime, while we're waiting. I'm Dr. Odette Souter, for those who don't know me. I'm a holistic vet. I'm in the Chicago area, and um, I deal mostly with small animals, dogs and cats. And um, I do a lot of educational things for people um, to you know, educate and empower people with animals so that they know things and they can, you know, talk to their vets and, and just know what to do and not be blindsided so much by what might be coming down the road. So I have a lot of educational stuff available, including my book, What Your Vet Never Told You, that's available on Amazon. And I put a link uh, in one of the earlier comments for that. And I also have a website, Peak Animal Health Center. Uh, peak as in mountain peak, P-E-A-K, animalhealthcenter.com. And you can also find me of my, on my Facebook page, Odette Souter DVM. Um, so other than being with animals, you know, one of my favorite things is to be with all of you guys, my online community. It's always nice to hang out and, you know, talk about how to heal your pets and, and give them the best life possible. So if you want to learn a little bit more about my my things that I offer. I also have a video series that goes into depth of all the, into all the things that are needed um, to keep animals healthy. Um, I talk about vaccines, electromagnetic radiation, and heartworm, and diet, and detox, and you know, <laughs> all the good stuff. Um, so anyways, I still don't see her uh, now that I've done my little spiel here. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start with um, you know, talking to you guys a little bit about um, teeth, and then um, hopefully she'll join. But actually, let me just um, um, text her real quick to see uh, what's happening because she may just not have connection or something. I'm not sure. Let me just text her real quick. Hold on. All right, I just texted her real quick just to see what's going on. Um, but anyways, um, let's just get started. Um, dental health is really, really important for the whole body. And about 80% of all dogs and cats, by the time they're three years old, have dental issues and, and you know some form of disease in the mouth. And sometimes we can see that really well. Uh, just by looking at the mouth, we can see that, that there's a lot of tartar there. There she is, hold on. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi, all right, so you're gonna be on live. There we go, hello, hi everyone. So this is Dr. Lisa Doring. She is uh, my one of my colleagues at Whole Pet, and she does all of our dentals and surgeries and, and things like that, and she's an amazing, amazing pet. She's very... <laughs> perfectionist so if you get teeth done at the whole pet you're gonna have like a shiny mouth you're gonna have to wear sunglasses <laughs> but not just that you know obviously wow. polishing and everything is great but you know the mouth is going to be really healthy and there's a lot of um you know a lot of dogs that i've sent to dr dorian to have their teeth done and they've done so much better afterwards i'm sure she'll share some of those success stories as well um, yeah, so this is Dr. Doring, and she is um, has a special Hi. interest in dentistry, and so we're going to talk a little bit about things. Um, I so I just started just um, exp uh, explaining to people how you know how prevalent dental disease is, and I just um, was talking about how some of it we can see. Um, so if you want to take it from there about what we can't see. Yes. I guess. <laughs> So, yeah, so I, I think probably the, the biggest thing that I would um, want people to know is that, you know, we've all heard of the tip of the iceberg. So if you think of the teeth as a um, the crowns that we see, the, so all the white part that we, you know, lift up the dog or cat's lip and look at is just the tip of the iceberg, um, all of the other parts of that are underneath. And um, 
it may seem like, you know, you bring your dog or, or cat in and, and the teeth may look good on the outside, um, but maybe the pet is, you know, four years old and has never had a, a dental cleaning before professionally, um, we may suggest that and so it may be hard to understand sometimes when you look at the mouth and say well you know they don't really look that bad do I really need to do this cleaning especially because you know anesthesia is involved um, but there is so much that hides underneath the gum line and the biggest part of the professional cleaning is really what we do in that area so it's that what we what we call subgingival scaling so subgingival is going to refer to um, underneath that gum line um, places that you can't reach with brushing you know even if you're brushing your dog or cat's teeth twice a day which is a lot i mean we like to see if people can do it once a day but there's places you can't get you know think about how you are so as humans you know, we're, it's recommended that we brush twice a day, we floss twice a day. Well, of course, flossing, you know, whether it be with re regular floss or water pick or whatever, you know, the little dental sticks, whatever you use, you're getting in between the teeth, you're getting uh, areas that you can't get with just brushing. And um, same thing with our pets. You know, now their teeth are a little different than ours. Um, some of them have a little are more spread out. Some of them are not. But there's all that's under the gum line that we need to uh, be able to clean. Um, I also have seen dogs uh, and cats who have other types of dental disease under the gum line. So when we talk about dental disease, typically we're talking about periodontal disease, which is bacterial. So, you know, a specific type of bacteria will get uh, access uh, in between the gum and the tooth, and then it works its way down and you'll actually see bone loss there. But there are other diseases that lurk under the gum line that uh, you may not think about. Um, one example in cats is uh, something we call resorption, where the body starts to absorb its own roots. And so that's something that we need to look at that's under the gum line. Um, dogs can get abscesses. I mean, how many dogs will like to chew on, you know, bones, rocks, sticks, no matter what you do to try to get them from picking up sticks or rocks outside. Some dogs, that's their guilty pleasure. So, um, you know, they could crack a tooth, even if it's not a crack that you can see. It can be a very hairline crack. All the tooth needs is for bacteria to gain access, and then that can cause an abscess. And Typically, when you think of an abscess, you think of swelling around the face, but there have been lots of times where I've seen cases where the teeth look pristine, but we get in there, we take our dental x-rays, and we see something under the gum line that is consistent with the beginnings of an abscess. So, um, so there's so much hiding under that gum line. Um, that's why it's really so important to, to get in and uh, have their teeth cleaned regularly no matter what they look like on the outside because what we see what you see on the crowns is really just cosmetic basically you know um all that plaque that tartar that's actually on the crown aside from the fact that that will allow more plaque to lay down on top of it um other than that it's it's really more cosmetic um you know that's not what's really causing uh the issue what i always tell people is when you start seeing a little bit of a red line along the gum that's really the time when uh you really need to think about having the cleaning done because that red line is gingivitis gingivitis is the first stage of periodontal disease um, there's four stages and that's the only stage that's reversible and it's reversible with professional cleaning and home care. So um, even if the teeth look white and there's hardly any tartar, if you're seeing that red line, then that tells me that there is uh, bacteria, debris, plaque that's getting under that gum line already. So, um, so I think that's really kind of one of the things we need to focus on more and as pet owners, you need to be aware of because um, I totally understand, you know, looking and saying, well, they look okay. And then it's hard to, to really understand why then, why are you saying that they need to come in, you know, for, uh, for this cleaning and anesthesia. Um, but that's, that's really why, because it is all there under the, 
uh, under the gum line. And if we don't do anything about it at that point, it will go and progress to stage two, which stage two, three, and four are not reversible. The only thing you can do once they go to stage two is delay progression. And that's gonna involve, again, regular cleaning, sometimes even more frequently than once a year, as well as really pretty aggressive home care. So, um, you know, so it's better to, to get that uh, started, you know, at an early age. I don't know, uh, uh, Dr. Studer, if you had um, said this already, but I know in the um, little ad for the Facebook Live, we talked about how, you know, the percentage of pets that have periodontal disease by the time they're about three years old or so. Um, I mean, it's a huge percentage of, of animals that have that, like 80% of them are going to have uh, periodontal disease already. So the time to really get in there is going to be a little bit earlier, um, especially for the small breeds. So that's the other big thing, you know, um, typically, and I know Dr. Suter is, is the same way. I mean, we all pretty much at the whole pet, I mean, we, you know, your, your general kind of guidelines are, you know, getting them in early, getting, let's get started with home care, let's get started with professional cleanings. But I, you know, I don't really just make a blanket statement recommendation for every single dog um, and cat with the dogs you know what i may say for a great dane as far as when to start your our professional cleanings may be a little different than what i recommend for uh, a little chihuahua or a little yorkie you know there are some differences in breeds as far as how severe the disease is as well and so because of that um, I'm going to suggest getting the little Yorkie or the little Chihuahua in at a much earlier age. And some people are surprised. You know, uh, I'll give an example with the Yorkies. Um, it's not unusual to have them come in at two years of age uh, or maybe even three and have to have 20 teeth or more extracted because that's how diseased they are already, even if they don't look that bad from the outside. Um, why would that happen? You know, one big thing is going to be they have the same number of teeth. Generally, they're programmed genetically. A, a Yorkie is going to be programmed to have 42 teeth and a Great Dane is going to be programmed genetically to have 42 teeth. Now that Yorkie may have a couple missing, you know, I'll see occasionally maybe two teeth missing, maybe four in uh, some small breed dogs like that. But still, even if they're missing four teeth, that's still 38 teeth in that little tiny mouth, you know, so you think of the Great Dane or the, any other larger breed or giant breed that those teeth are spread out a lot more. So when you have teeth that are spread out more, you don't have as much debris that gets caked in there. Now, they still definitely will have dental disease, but it doesn't seem to, um, you know, necessarily start as early, whereas the little little dogs, the, the tiny, the teacup dogs that, you know, they are going to have um, all those teeth crammed into such a small mouth. So there's so much crowding that that alone is a huge predisposition. And then you have also genetics, you know, um, genetics. I think everybody probably has some example from uh, your life, how um, I know I can, my example is that I, I am obsessive about teeth, of course. So I, I'm obsessive <laughs> about taking care of my own teeth, but I have horrible teeth genetically. You know, I just don't have good genetics with regard to it, but yet my, um, you know, I have some relatives who, um, in-laws who have never had a cavity before and they're the same age as me or a little older. So, you know, how do we explain that? And it's frustrating, but sometimes, you know, there are some powers that are, you know, not out of our control. So we control what we can. Then we get to some breeds that have um, what breeds that we would say are what's called brachycephalic. Those are the breeds like English Bulldogs, um, Boston Terriers, the ones that have the kind of shorter snouts, um, their teeth. So now they have the same number of teeth, but not only, you know, are they uh, crowded in because they're smaller than, you know, giant breed, but they're also even more crowded because of that. And they're facing all different directions. Plus they are more prone to gum issues. So there's, there's so many things to think about. And um, so I may recommend, you know, some dogs come in at the age of one, let's get started and see, because if we want to try to keep those teeth as healthy as possible, we need to make sure we jump on that. Whereas, you know, a larger breed dog, 
may be fine with coming in and, you know, maybe at three, maybe four. Um, I, I do still feel like we don't want to wait too long. I mean, obviously it's, it is case by case. If, if I have a dog that has no, no gingivitis, meaning no, no red line there or anything, you know, I may um, decide that we can wait a little bit longer, but, um, but that's pretty much, you know, getting them in earlier and getting started because it is so, so prevalent. Um, right. and, and it's uncomfortable for them, you know, um, I don't know if you have any other, I mean, it's kind of like with <laughs> us, you know, if we have a tooth that's not feeling good, I mean, we do want to have it taken care of, you know, obviously with us, we probably feel it sooner, but our animals, they, they tend to hide the pain. They tend to not really show it as much. And I'm, I'm sure you you see that all the time, you know, dogs that are still behaving somewhat normally, the owner doesn't really notice it much, but then once all these diseased teeth are uh, removed, they feel so much better, right? I mean, I'm sure you have yeah. some examples of that. Um, yeah, I would say, and that's one of the things that I find is the most rewarding for me. Um, and, and this is something that I, I try to really spend the time talking to pet owners about. Um, is that my goal is really to have a healthy and pain-free mouth. Now, I know that might not be, um, I mean, that's obviously the pet owners, you know, and nobody wants their animals to be in pain and nobody wants their animals to have an unhealthy mouth. But they, what, what also comes into play from a uh, standpoint of, you know, your, your pets is cosmetically. Now, cosmetically, we relate to that because of us, you know, we think, oh my gosh, if we had had to have all these teeth removed, that would be awful. Or, you know, how are we going to eat without those teeth? Um, but they, it's so different with them. You know, one, they don't think about cosmetics. So for emotionally, they have no connection to that. Right. So um, then secondly, it, they live with us. They're not out in the wild. So from a, a functional standpoint, they can eat with lots of teeth missing. Um, and so it's not, you know, uh, it's not as bad as what we would think it is. Um, and then it, it really, um, I mean, obviously the goal is to not get to that point where we have to remove all those teeth. But when they do have severe disease, they have been in pain. So they're actually less painful. I've had some dogs where I've removed, you know, 23, 24 teeth, and they're actually eating that night. Um, and, and a lot of times the owners can tell even the first night that they feel better. Now, sometimes that's hard because anesthesia is still wearing off. So I wouldn't like jump into it thinking that that's what you're going to see. But I would say over that time period where healing takes place, which is about 10 days uh, before I have you go back to kind of more normal activity, um, it's I get so much feedback from people saying, you know, oh, my gosh, you know, my dog she didn't want to go outside and I thought she was just getting older. And this is really where you, you know, see with the older dogs, we, we assume that maybe they have arthritis or they're just getting old and maybe they're getting cranky. Um, and so we just kind of attribute that to aging and after a, a dental cleaning and in, even in cases where we've had to remove, you know, nearly all the teeth or half of the teeth, they come back to me and they say, I thought she just didn't want to go outside anymore. She just wasn't into walks anymore because her legs were hurting her. But now she's asking to go outside or, you know, I haven't seen him pick up that toy for uh, two years or, you know, or he picked it up, but he would just put it down, never played with it. And now he's playing with it. And, you know, so these things you wouldn't notice beforehand, you know, it's looking back afterwards that you see and you realize, and it's just because, you know, again, like, like Dr. Suter was saying, they don't, they hide it. Um, they also, obviously they can't tell us, you know, so they're, they're going to eat. Um, and that's another misconception that we'll see is um, a lot of times, um, which is natural. People will assume that if their teeth were hurting, they wouldn't be eating. What, what I describe to people is that if I, if someone gave me, you know, my favorite food, or even if it wasn't my favorite food, but I was starving, was hungry. Um, 
if my teeth hurt, I'm still going to eat. And I have in most situations. So I've been through it. I'm still going to eat. I may not eat with as much vigor. I may complain because I have the ability to complain or I may say, oh, I need to go to the dentist. Um, they can't do that, but they're still going to eat. It takes a lot. It really takes quite a lot for them to actually stop eating because of dental pain. Dental pain in, in pets tends to creep up slowly. So it's more of a chronic low grade pain. And that's why that's also another reason why they're able to deal with it and why they don't stop eating because it's something that kind of slowly builds up and then hits this level where it's just chronic. Um, you know, and then it also can affect the rest of their body, all that bacteria just sitting there. Um, you know, so when we have those diseases kind of going back to extracting, I usually tell people, and I tend to be a little more aggressive on the recommendations for extractions. Um, obviously it's, you know, the pet owner's decision and I'm not going to force somebody to do anything, but I, I see it as why invest all that time and energy and, uh, everything to save a tooth or, or teeth that are so diseased when we could just get those out and start with a clean slate and focus on the teeth that are healthy there, you know, focus your energy and time on that. Plus if you have a tooth that's loose and affected, I, I don't, I think that affects the quality of life of your pet and you, because now you're having to chase them around the house. You know, it's going to be hard to brush anyway, but now you're trying to brush a tooth that's wiggling when you brush it, maybe bleeding, you know, maybe the gums are going to be sore. You've maybe got some root exposure, so they're going to be uncomfortable. And so now you're fighting against that already. And, and that does affect the quality, you know, the emotional bond between you because you're trying to fight them to do something, you know, when if we just get that out of there and work on the ones that are, uh, are healthy. So... Um, sorry, Dr. Studer, I go, I can talk all night about this stuff. So. <laughs> I know, that's good, that's good. I mean, that's why we're doing this, because I wanted to get that input from, from you, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't do the dentals, I just send them to you, but I see them before and I see them after, and, you know, just from my own experience, I had a bad um, tooth that had a root canal, and I had no idea that there was a problem there, but it was affecting my entire body. I, I mean, I was just flat on my back until I finally figured out that that's what it was. And so the same for the animals, you know, it affects their kidneys, it affects their hearts, it can make diabetes worse. I mean, there's so many things that it can affect. Um, so it's not just you know, a cosmetic thing that there's a little bit of tartar here or, so, or just this one tooth that may be an issue. It's not just localized. It really affects the entire body. And I think we need to, you know, think more body wide, more globally that way when we when we talk about teeth. Um, and teeth are also a reflection of what's going on inside the body. So, you know, if we see a lot of bad teeth, then we also know that we need to take care of the body more because the healthier an animal is, the less dental issues they will have as well. And, you know, just to get back to, to the small animals and the, you know, their badness of teeth, <laughs> um, you know, what kind of strikes me a little bit is that, you know, with, with small animals, the vaccine dose that they get is the same as for a, a large dog. And we know from studies that were done at Purdue University um, is that, you know, so these vac when dogs that are vaccinated, um, they're, they develop autoantibodies to their own tissue proteins, including um, collagen. And the periodontal ligament that attaches the, the tooth to the bone um, is made of collagen. So, you know, one has to kind of wonder if maybe with the small dogs who get such an overdose, if they just have a, a stronger autoimmune response. I mean, obviously, plus yeah. everything that you mentioned, but you know, there are just some things to think about. Right, know, right. I mean, there's are definitely so many factors that come into play. So, um, you know, but it's, uh, it, it is a, always a question everybody asks about the little dogs and why, you know, why are their teeth so bad? But yeah, so many different things come into play there. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I'll mention, too, is that with from a brushing standpoint, um, and I've run into this where um, we have, you know, very well intentioned pet owners who are just awesome with brushing and they will brush daily or twice daily. They do such an awesome job that we look at the teeth and we're like, wow, they're so they look good. The gums on the outside look good. Um, 
that's awesome. That's great. But we still need to get in and clean the areas that you can't reach with the brush because I have seen cases where even though the brushing's awesome on the outside and they look great on the outside, it's the inside that has um, where you can't get. And I mean, trust me, I've tried so many different times on my own dogs to, <laughs> they probably get frustrated yeah, they probably all the time to try to <laughs> oh, get the inside. The and, <laughs> so, um, but you, you just, there's only so much you could do and it kind of gives you a false sense of security. I wouldn't say to stop, definitely keep up with the brushing because that's awesome. That really does help the teeth, but we can't forget about the insides. Um, we still need to get in there because I have had situations where we get in then and, you know, maybe the pet owner has not done a dental cleaning professionally for a few years because they thought the teeth looked good because they brush regularly, but they're not seeing the insides. And so that bone loss and that periodontal disease can still occur on the inside. So, um, you know, I, we definitely would still want them to come in. And, and one of the benefits, though, less anesthesia time, you know, I mean, if you're brushing regularly, and we get them in regularly for that cleaning of the areas that you can't reach, um, it's going to be less anesthesia time as well, you know, which is great, a quicker procedure, less cost because we're going to have less likely uh, extractions. Um, so all around, you know, um, I, I understand the anesthesia can be a big, you know, um, hurdle for some people to get over. I mean, I never, I've been doing this for, 21 years now, and um, I'll never take anesthesia lightly. You know, I, I, I'll, that will be something I'll never, ever take lightly. And, um, you know, I, I understand that it's hard for a lot of people to, um, to get to that point where they're okay, you know, making that leap. Um, but it's so worth it. I truly, truly feel that the risk of dental disease and the risk of untreated dental disease is far greater than the risk of anesthesia. Um, now, of course, that also depends on what you do with anesthesia. And, you know, so we, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, I yeah, I think that's that a good you. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point um, because there's so much worry about anesthesia, especially in older animals. So I, I'm wondering if we could maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, the process of anesthesia, what's used and how much and so on. And I'll, I'll maybe start with just explaining a little bit how I prepare the animals before they come to you. And then if you want to take over. Um, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, so so basically, all the animals that that come to us for for a dental, obviously they get a physical, um, a thorough physical, just to see what's going on. You know what what other issues may be present, and then we do blood work. Um, so we always check to see how the liver is functioning, how the kidneys are working, because those are the organs that are going to help to detoxify. We also check, you know, red blood cell count and, and platelets and all of that that also are important for oxygen transport, clotting, um, you know, so, so we do a, a really good checkup to see what's going on. And when I have an animal that has pre-existing issues um, where I feel like we just need to give it a little extra support, then I will give them a little extra support before I send them on to Dr. Doring, so it may take another month or so just to kind of get them a little more stabilized with diets and, and so on. And then uh, usually about a week or so before the, uh, for, before the dental, I put them on a bit of a detox protocol that helps to prepare the liver um, to, to kind of open its channels, as I say, just to kind of be able to function and deal with the uh, um, with you know the drugs that are going to be coming through the anesthesia, um, I also put them on the higher doses of vitamin C, and I use a liposomal form because a liposomal form gets absorbed really easily into the system, contrary to um, the powdered forms of vitamin C. They usually just eighty percent of it goes out the the rear end, um, so the liposomal form they get, and then uh, once you know, and I do that for about a week. And then after the dental, I will just have them continue um, with the vitamin um, C and then also continue with the detox. But anyway, so that's how they're getting prepared uh, for it. And then Dr. Doring um, takes over. So your turn. 
<laughs> so, um, so after, you know, their exams um, and, and all of the prep work, um, you know, we've got their, uh, their blood work, um, any specific other things that need to be done. So from an anesthesia standpoint, there may be, um, you know, reasons that I may choose a special anesthetic drug or maybe a different dosing. Um, we do also do a pre-op um, ECG. So we recommend a pre-op ECG and that's just to make sure the heart rhythm's good. You know, we listen to them, of course, listen for murmurs. Um, if a, a dog or cat has any abnormalities uh, with the heart on an exam or on the ECG, then we talk about possibly doing an echocardiogram depending on you know, the, the actual problem at hand, if that's warranted, um, or chest x-rays if needed to look at the shape and size of the heart. So that's all just based on a case by case, um, you know, situation and the findings from exam and, and the pre-op testing. Um, once they, we kind of have a little bit of a, um, a, another type of prep, I guess I would say, is we, we look at the animal's temperament too. You know, some dogs are more anxious than others. Um, cats definitely can be more anxious when they're coming in. Um, so if we feel, and this is what we talk to uh, pet owners about, is if we feel that there would be a benefit um, to uh, giving anything that may help calm that patient prior to having that uh, procedure performed, then we would discuss that and uh, may send them home with uh, a medication or two to calm them. And typically that might be something, um, you know, like a, a little bit of a, a sedative. Um, there's one that's called trazodone that we've used. There's one that's called gabapentin. Um, you know, those, and, and I think sometimes, you know, people might be a little resistant because, you you know, I understand not wanting to use a bunch of different medications, but we, we also have to think about it from the emotional standpoint and how stressed that, that patient is. Because not only, you know, is the patient maybe going to be stressed or anxious coming in, but that works against some of the anesthetic drugs. When we have a, a dog or cat come in and the adrenaline has kicked in, that's going to work against us trying to get that patient under anesthesia. So we may have to, you know, use a higher dose of, a, of the sedatives, um, the injectable ones that we use, like our pre, what we would call pre-medication. We may have to use a higher dose of some of our uh, medications, our anesthetics that we use to induce the state of anesthesia. We may have to use a higher level of gas anesthesia. Um, all of those things, you know, by using higher doses of all of those, that's where we, you know, you can run into um, issues with blood pressure and, and you know, more of our, our complications that can be seen. So, um, and this isn't every dog that needs this or every cat that needs this, you know, it's, it's, there are select few animals that, you know, we know or the owners know that they're just anxious animals, you know, and so we want to get that on board because then that also helps us not only when they come in, they're a little less anxious, but then that helps us to be able to use lesser dosages um, or dosing of medications to get them under anesthesia. So typically what we do is we would place um, an IV catheter. So um, usually in one of the front legs, um, and that way we have access to the vein. We give a, an anti-nausea medication, um, the anti-nausea medication, because any of you who've ever had any sedatives or anesthesia, you know, at, at the hospitals, um, they can cause some nausea. So plus they haven't eaten that morning. Um, so that is very helpful. Um, and that medication actually, um, you know, can have a little bit of some um, analgesic or anti-pain effect too um, that we're starting to find. So, um, so it kind of has a little bit of a double effect. But the main reason they they would get that would be for nausea. Um, then we give something to re relax them, and then uh, pain medication. So we give pain medication ahead of time, and that's because. You know, even if the patient's not going to have any extractions, um, 
it can be painful or uncomfortable. That's why we have to do their cleanings um, asleep. You know, I mean, if we're digging or, you know, having to clean under the gum line, most animals are not going to sit for that. Um, if we do have to do extraction, we want that pain medication on board in the system ahead of time. We want to treat that pain ahead of time before there's any receptors that, you know, and, and signals that cause that pain because it, it's harder to treat pain when we have to chase it backwards and, and treat after they're already painful. So, um, so that is a medication we give. And then depending on the dog, sometimes that's the only medication we give is the pain medication because it does have a sedative effect. Um, younger dogs, they're dogs that are a little more, um, you know, uh, active and hyper, then we'll have to give them a little bit something more of a sedative um, again so that we can get them under anesthesia. Um, we usually let that sit uh, for, you know, let that absorb in their system get uh, after the injection for maybe a half hour or so. Um, I like to give all of my patients oxygen before we start anesthesia. So we use a little mask. Um, you know, again, just like if you go to the uh, hospital or surgical center for anything, they'll usually put the oxygen line on you in the prep area. You know, they'll get you on fluids and get the oxygen going. Um, you know, we like to do that with our patients, um, just get them on supplemental oxygen. Then we do that for about five minutes and then we um, start with our uh, injectable anesthesia. Um, we use a lot of the same medications that are used in the human side. So, um, you know, propofol is what we typically will use. Um, I may adjust that based on condition of the patient, but that's typically what we'll use. Um, and we do everything also um, by effect. So, I'm not just, you know, calculating a dose and giving that amount because that animal weighs a certain weight, you know, or a certain number of pounds. I, we give it a little bit at a time. And when we, we look, we monitor, when we see that patient is ready to have the breathing tube placed or what we would call the endotracheal tube, that's when we stop and we place that tube. And then we get them connected to our gas anesthesia. Um, the gas anesthesia that, anesthesia that we use is called isoflurane. Um, and the gas anesthesia is really kind of the, um, you know, when everyone um, is concerned about complications or different things that can happen, you know, a lot of it is with our gas anesthesia. Um, it, it can lower blood pressure and lower heart rate and those things, but we do by giving the pre-medications and giving lower doses of different combinations, we allow, uh, it allows us to be able to use less gas anesthesia. Um, so the less, the least gas anesthesia we can use, the better for the patient, the, the less chance of blood pressure changes and other changes. Um, so we also monitor very, very closely. Um, and we, you know, not only do we use the machines to monitor, but I'm very adamant about hands and eyes and ears. So, um, you know, it's me and my dental technician that are monitoring and I never, never, never rely on machines 100%. So um, we're always listening with stethoscope. We're always checking with our hands. So we're looking, you know, all the different uh, parameters that we can monitor um, because I think it's a big mistake to not do that. Um, so, you know, that's one way that we avoid issues. Um, if I notice a, a little bit of a change in blood pressure, I'm going to react right away. I'm going to start lowering the gas anesthesia or make a little change here or there so that we can combat that and not wait. Um, we also work on keeping the temperatures normal. Um, we use a warm water circulating blanket underneath the patient. We use a warm air blanket on top of the patient. And if we have to, we even put socks on their feet because dogs and cats, you know, they'll lose heat from their paw pads. So um, we oftentimes, I mean, I would say generally pretty much for most all patients, we have normal temps when they're waking up, you know, and that's a huge thing because it's when the temperatures drop and get low that you see other complications as well. Um, I mentioned we check blood pressure. So that's a, a big one, you know, heart rate. We check carbon dioxide levels, um, oxygen levels, um, you know, uh, temperature. Uh, so we, we do all of that monitoring um, and 
a, again, we have somebody that's there, um, you know, so it's not just um, me, it's a technician and me and we take turns, you know, the technician will be doing the cleaning while I'm monitoring. And then when it's my turn and I'm examining the teeth, then the technician's monitoring. And we're always in communication with any little changes that are occurring. Um, one other thing that I'll do if I'm extracting teeth or even, and I've, I do this in some cases, if a dog has um, really bad gingivitis and they're uncomfortable when we're cleaning, rather than, you know, me turning that gas anesthesia up, um, I do a local block. So just like when you go to the dentist to have a tooth uh, worked on and they give you Novocaine, we have local anesthesia that we use uh, as well. And, and some people are surprised by that because they think, why do you need to do local anesthesia if, they, if they're asleep, you know? Um, well, it, it's very important because if we can do that, we can have them on such a low level of gas anesthesia that all of their parameters are staying normal. I mean, everything we do, everything I try to do is to try to minimize any kind of, of problem, you know, or combat a problem, prevent a problem. It's, it's all preemptive, trying to prevent anything from occurring. And I, I find that those, the local anesthesia works wonders um, in, like I said, sometimes even just for the clean, even just for cleaning, um, we're seeing that we have to turn this gas anesthesia up. I'm going to say, let's do local anesthesia. Let's do local block on this dog. And then we can turn that other, the other anesthesia possible angle and, um, you know, not ever just look at one, every patient as the same because they're not, you know. Um, and so hopefully that helps. From a comfort standpoint, you know, I, I do tell patients, clients that I, I, I wish I could 100% take away any risk and unfortunately I can't, but I can, I am very, very comfortable um, at, with what we do and um, very, you know, comfortable with uh, the types of anesthesia we use, the, the uh, approach we take. Uh, as far as the safety is concerned. And, and anesthesia has changed so much over the years too. You know, I mean, I, I do, a lot of people have stories, unfortunately, where they've said, I'm so scared to do, have my dog come in for anesthesia for dental cleaning because, you know, my, my friend's dog died under anesthesia after a dental cleaning or from a, a spay or something. And um, I don't know all the details of those stories. I know some of them, you know, we're at times where anesthesia was done differently. Things have changed so much over the years. And we, you know, a lot of it is like the human side, you know, um, but you, you always want to ask if you have questions, ask, you know, ask what, how the anesthesia is done. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, that's how we do it. And, and I, like I said, I, I, um, I'm more than happy to, you know, talk to people one on one uh, because I, I understand the fear, and I'll, I'll never make anybody feel like it's not, you know, justified because it it is something that everybody can be a little afraid of. So, right, right, it's it's a risk, and at the same time, it's a risk not doing um, the the dental either. So, I mm -hmm. guess you know, out of curiosity, what's the oldest dog you've ever done a dental on? Um, uh, when I practiced in Florida, there was a dog that was, uh, 21 years old that I did a dental procedure oh, wow. on, um, a cat, a cat that was 22, my own dog, um, the, my own dog that I had prior, um, his name was Finley. He was, uh, like 17 and a half when I did his last dental cleaning. Um, and unfortunately he had cancer later that year, you know, um, but uh, but that actually that just reminds me really quickly too of the other thing is with with our dental cleanings I do a full oral exam look at the tonsils the back of the throat um, you know the lips everything and that's another thing that you know we all have to remember is that yes we're focusing on the teeth and dental disease but we need we have to remember dogs and cats can get oral cancer too and so it's very very important to get a good thorough oral exam regularly. Um, more so than you can get when they're awake. Um, and I have had some cases where I've found uh, little tumors that are small enough that we could cure the problem or get a jump start on it and help that pet 
Whereas if we didn't do that dental procedure, you know, um, and I've had some where they've come in, you know, every year for cleaning. And so it could be very easy for a client to say, well, you know, I've been coming in every year. I'm going to skip this year. And I've had, you know, where we find a little tumor or something. And if that pet didn't come in that year, then it could be, you know, much larger, much harder to, to treat. Um, so that's another thing I just wanted to add in there too, why it's also important um, because we want to make sure we catch some of those things too. Right. And then at the end of anesthesia, you also use IV yes. vitamin C, correct? And maybe yes. can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you see as, a, as the benefit um, I, I know I've heard you say some things, yeah, <laughs> so, so I just want to want you to share that. Oh, definitely, um, it, hel it helps with their detox. It helps with, um, you know, waking up uh, better, faster. Um, we usually will start that right at the uh, like as that as we're waking them up. Basically, we'll get them uh, on that, and um, we generally will see that uh, it, it does make make a difference with them, uh, you know, how they wake up, um, how, how fast they wake up. They're not as, uh, they don't have like as many lingering effects um, of the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, that's definitely helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And for anyone who wants to talk to their vet about adding some vitamin C, um, it would just be important to do that at the end because vitamin C will destroy drugs. So if you were to give IV vitamin C while they're fully on their, under anesthesia and you still want to do procedure, it's not going to work as well. Um, I've had my experience in myself with that where I had to get some dental work done and I needed a local block and I had taken a bunch of vitamin C ahead of time. Unfortunately, the local block did not work because the vitamin C was just destroying the drug as, as they were pushing it in. Uh, so he had to re-inject over and over again for me to even... No you know, be able to not feel it. So that's why vitamin C has to be given at the end. Um, but it's something that's pretty simple to do. And we can certainly provide some information if any of your vets are interested. Um, so we do have a lot of questions here and uh, I just want to jump in and maybe, uh, you know, answer some of them, you know, maybe a little more briefly so we can get through them a little bit because um, there's a ton of them. Um, so one of them is obviously about um, anesthesia-free dentistry, and I know you've already answered a lot of that in a sense, but maybe you could talk a little bit about potentially the benefits of it, um, you know, aside from what you already talked to us about, that we can't really see things without doing a proper full exam, but maybe just talk a little bit about what the benefits might be. So, yeah, this is something that um, I've talked with some of um, other my other colleagues about as well. And um, one of the big things that I think with the anesthesia free dentistry um, that we have to you have to be careful of is that it can um, give you a false sense of security. But I do think that there can be a place for it. Um, you know, it is hard to do regular brushing. So in between professional cleanings um, as long as the the dog uh, allows it um, or cat I, I've um, I've personally not seen any cats that have had it done but um, you know uh, there are some dogs that can tolerate that will tolerate uh, that anesthesia free um, but it depends on you know who's doing it how they do it you know you want to just like with anything you want to ask ask questions about, you know, what exactly are they doing? Where are they getting? Because if they're just doing one surface, then, you know, again, we're going to be missing another surface. And, and I would say it's pretty probably not the majority of patients that will allow it. Um, so it has to be a, a patient that will allow it. Um, and my opinion is that it, it would be it would work best in between professional cleanings as a way to be that kind of extra like home care in a way, um, you know, because if you use it as a, as a substitute for the professional cleaning, I think that's where you can get into some trouble because you're not, you, you just, there's not a good way to really truly get under 
the gum line, even if you think you're getting there, um, especially if there's disease present. And that's the other key. Like if we're talking about from a preventive, what we would call a dental prophy, um, then I think it can be very helpful. But if you if there's already established periodontal disease, um, I, I they really need to have an anesthetic cleaning. There's just not a good way. I mean, I've even had some uh, patients where I've under anesthesia, I'm trying to clean in the periodontal pockets and there's only so so deep you can get in there. Um, you know, and if there's a tooth that needs to come out, we'll often see that, you know, there's tartar down along that route that if we didn't extract that tooth, it looked like you can get it and you got it, but it's, you know, you don't. And so there's not a way they can do that with the anesthesia free. So I think you just have to be careful with how you, um, you know, the pay, the, how you choose that for your, for your pet. Um, and it would have to be certain, um, certain conditions. So um, I don't know, Dr. Suter, what your thoughts are, but I, I definitely think there's a place for it. It just has to, you can't use it as a replacement. Right. I think I, I would agree with that, you know, to use it in between if, if need be. Um, you know, if, if, for example, well, yeah, if you have a dog that won't let you brush their teeth, it probably won't work either for yeah. anesthesia-free yeah. dentistry. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, maybe for some dogs that really can't have anesthesia, you know, it's, it would be better than nothing. Um, you know, some of the heart patients, for example, um, that just can't tolerate anesthesia. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think I would agree. Um, but there is so much uh, that we can do in between, um, you know, just with home care, as you mentioned. And um, we have one question here from Heather Ann. Would an ultrasonic uh, toothbrush be good for dogs? So maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, the types of tools that we can use. And then also maybe some of the additives and supplements and things like that just to support um, dental health in general. Yes. Yeah, so um, I've had some people that have used some of the uh, ultrasonic toothbrushes. Um, the biggest issue, uh, well, I guess one of the big issues, of course, is, again, the patient selection or the pet selection, because some of them are just not going to like the noise. Some of them are not going to like the feeling of it. So you do have to if you're up, if you want to do something like that, you do have to really kind of condition them kind of like if you're getting, you know, you have a dog that's never had his nails trimmed before. You want to get them used to uh, certain things. You don't want to just come at them with the toothbrush right away. Um, the other drawback of ultrasonic is you do have to, um, just like with us, I know I had an ultrasonic toothbrush and I ended up causing gum recession because I was so <laughs> vigorous with the brushing, you know, um, and really you, you want to just kind of lightly hold it almost like a pencil grip. Um, and if you are making your brushing motion while using it, you can actually then cause gum recession. So, you know, most of our pets are not going to like if it's uncomfortable, they're not going to let you do that anyway. Um, so but I think if you had, you know, even something like the spin brush or something that may not necessarily be ultrasonic, um, it can be beneficial if the dog tolerates it and if you're not putting pressure on it. Um, I personally just um, I don't use any of the electronic or the electric toothbrushes. Um, I just use, uh, you know, typical um, and there's so many different brushes you could use. You could use uh, a regular um, human baby toothbrush. You, I would suggest using one that has soft bristles um, because, again, that's going to be more comfort for the pet. Um, there's finger brushes. There's one um, that I am using from. Uh, Barclays, that's a 360 degree finger brush. And um, it's nice because it's got the bristles all the way around it. So when you are getting into the mouth, um, it, you don't have to have your finger turned a certain way, you know, because if your finger turns as you're brushing, then there's bristles all around it. Um, I've also uh, seen uh, or used another one that's a 360 degree toothbrush that looks almost like a tiny bottle brush um, that's very soft and they make them for babies, um, but they also have some for dogs and cats. And so same thing, it, but it, except it's on a, you know, it has a brush handle. And so you can put that in and you can kind of twirl it and, um, you know, get to the teeth that way. Um, I've even had cat owners use Q-tips 
um, with the toothpaste on it. So, I mean, that's not going to have bristles on it. So it's not as ideal as a brush, but Hey, you know, if you can get, if you can get toothpaste on a Q-tip in a cat on their teeth. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's going to be definitely better than nothing. And, and the Q-tip's so small, you know, cats mouths are so small and their, their cheeks are kind of so, uh, Tight, it's hard to get anything in there. Um, wipes are another way you could go. I mean, a, a brush with soft bristles is going to be probably your best bet. Um, but again, don't be discouraged if you can't do that because any mechanical action is going to be helpful. So even using wipes, wipes that are either pre-made that come with, um, you know, some a dental product uh, on it already, or you can even have your own where you just put toothpaste on a, a gauze. You can get, um, you know, the first aid gauze from the store. You can even use like a thin washcloth and cut it into little pieces and put that on and just kind of, you know, wipe with the, the toothpaste there. Um, so that's even helpful. Um, so there's lots of different you know, ways as far as um, uh, brushing can go. It doesn't have to be a brush, um, although that would be your Kind of your gold standard if you can do that. Um, so, How about other flossing? Too. <laughs> I, so I've actually had people who usually it's going to be a client who's a dental hygienist because oh. they, you know, really want to get in there. And and I I have my my prior dog. I um I did actually try with floss once to get into the the mm -hmm. front teeth because he was just really good with that. But um you know. That's something that, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be expecting people to do. Um, but if the if the dog's very calm and tolerates it, and you want to do it, and it works for you, then you know maybe on a uh, maybe usually, on a greyhound. Yeah, I mean, usually it's it's because like the you know the front teeth or an area that you really need to to um, to get to. But um, I'll never I won't stop anybody from doing it if they really want to do it. But um, but yeah, that's not not going to be the the typical thing um but there are other products too so even if you can't brush um don't get, get discouraged because there are other products that can be used so it's you know um things like water additives that can be used um they can help decrease the plaque um there are some powders that help to work against plaque and periodontal disease. There's shoes that can be given um, for both cats and dogs and, um, you know, all kinds of things that can be beneficial. Um, so using a combination of those things, or if you can't use a combination, um, you know, because you can't brush or whatever, then, um, you know, choosing whatever's going to work best for you. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of um, comments about teeth, which is one of the water additive additives that we carry as well, which is a newer product that works more um, in the sense of supporting the mouth, the you know the microbes in the mouth, and supporting the good microbes and feeding those to kind of out crowd the the not so beneficial ones. Um, and I know we we use it in our in, in the practice at the whole pet. I use it in my own practice as well. Um, have you, uh, I mean, we haven't really had this product for all that long yet, but have you seen differences in, in those that have been using this um, teeth? That's what it's called. Um, and, you know, can you comment on that maybe? Um, I, I think it definitely is helpful, um, but you know, yeah, I'm not sure that we've had it um, long enough to have uh, to be able to have a, a uh, that patient back in um, and be able to to see you know where we're at uh, with that. But I know just from reading the um, the paperwork, the studies, and everything that you'd given me too that. Um, it definitely see, is very promising um, mm -hmm. as far as helping, but um, but I think we probably would be coming up on that pretty soon, um, where we've had it, uh, where we might, you know, I might be getting some pets in soon that have been on it long enough that I could uh, compare. Um, but you know, I, I definitely 
anything like that can can really be helpful uh, as an adjunct um, or if you can't do anything at all again um, and and also your um, I forgot to mention the, the TDC capsule so that is sterified fatty acid um, they're capsules that you can cut and squirt on the gums. Um, so for dogs that have really excessive gingivitis or cats that have really excessive gingivitis, they're kind of overreacting to the plaque. That can be something that can be used to, um, you know, and be, be helpful. So I think however we can support the, the teeth and the surrounding structures um, with whatever we've got available, all of that can be beneficial for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, with with teeth or, you know, some of what you just mentioned, um, what was it called? Um, well, they're, they're TDC capsules. It's, a, it's an aesthetic. Yeah, that's what yeah. they're different brands. So, yeah, because those are more supportive and, and encouraging because it's just like, you know, in, in in general, you know, we have two approaches to health. Either we go kill things or we support the things that are beneficial. And so same with, with the mouth, you know, if we use a lot of things that destroy and kill bacteria and microbes in general, then we're basically affecting the biome of the mouth and possibly in a negative way where, you know, some of these microbes become resistant and then create more damage in the long run. Whereas if we support the good ones um, and, and support the terrain, then it can sort of, you know, re, not restore itself, but maybe at least, you know, stay healthier as far as the biome goes. And I don't know if, if you've heard already, it's, it's a bit newer, um, animal biome, they do the microbiome test for, um, you know, the gut. They also now have a microbiome test for the mouth. Um, oh, yeah. You know, have you heard of that? I thought I heard something, but I'd forgotten about that. So yeah, that would be definitely yeah. an yeah, we interesting should definitely thing to incorporate it and, and see a little bit too, you know, how how the mouth is and in certain dogs that tend to have recurrent um, mm -hmm. issues and then we um, work with those a little bit better so that we don't have to do dentals uh, as frequently, you know. Um, yeah, because, because I mean, there are some dogs, hard. yeah, they, they, you know, you do the dental and then a month later, I'm like, um, I think your mm -hmm. dog needs a dental and they're like, uh, we just had one, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm exaggerating yeah. with the month, but, um, yeah. No, but that's, yeah, the dogs that are prone to it, definitely, um, I mean, if they have established periodontal disease, you know, really, they technically should come in more frequently than once a year. And so if we can target, you know, by finding out which dogs are going to be, um, you know, more prone and we can kind of uh, attack it from a different way, then maybe we can avoid that and still keep them good. Because again, you think about a human and if you had periodontal disease and you needed to have deep cleanings, you're going to be going in probably at least every three months, you know, and it's just right. not really that practical to do that, you know, um, putting them under anesthesia so frequently plus cost, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. All right, so um, how do you feel about all those drugs being a holistic vet, Dr. Suter? I'm assuming you mean all the <laughs> anesthesia drugs? Well, the thing is, you know, I, I'm obviously not a drug fan, but, um, you know, having dental disease is worse for the body than having to deal with a drug, I think. Uh, at least that's my opinion. And again, I'm just kind of referring back to my own uh, root canal tooth that was giving me issues and I had no idea what it was. And I was so sick um, and it didn't, you know, it wasn't until that tooth was removed that I was feeling better. So um, I would rather have a dog have a little bit of drugs to get these teeth out and, and the, the mouth cleaned because for one, I know they will have less pain and discomfort. Their bodies have a chance of being healthier um, because they don't have to constantly fight against whatever is released because when the mouth is infected, there's so many bacteria there and a lot of them, they, you know, they get released into the bloodstream every time they eat but they also uh, secrete toxins. You know, a lot of these um, 
these microbes, they, they release toxins that go into the body and then um, create damage in the body. So um, I would rather have a clean ha mouth and a, a healthy mouth and have a little bit of um, drugs in, in the process, which they're short term. And, you know, we do everything possible with the dental, uh, with a, the detox ahead of time and afterwards and vitamin C and then vitamin C at the end of anesthesia. I think it's, I, I would rather have a dog um, get a dental and have a little bit of drugs than having a horrible mouth. Um, health wise, I think it's a bad, you know, dent, you know dental disease is worse than um, having a little bit of drugs um, for a short time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me just see what else do we have as far as questions go. Um, we covered that. Um, so do we have any recommendations for a toothpaste? Um, I personally don't use toothpaste for my own teeth because I just don't like it. I, I hate the taste of it and I don't think it really makes that much of a difference. Um, but with dogs and cats, it may be a little bit different just because you can't reach as well. I mean, I can reach better. I, you know, I can keep my mouth open <laughs> to get to all the places. But what's, what are your thoughts? What are your recommendations, Dr. Doring? Um, so it really does boil down to the mechanical action, um, truly. But, um, you know, the toothpaste, depending on what toothpaste you use, they do have some uh, things in them that can help to um, minimize the the return of plaque and things like that. So there's um, there's all kinds. There's you know uh, natural ones and some that are not so natural. Um, one that uh, is a good one um, that also has the Veterinary Oral Health Council. Uh, seal is healthy mouth um, and that's a natural toothpaste um, there is you know there's several others that don't have the seal it doesn't mean they're not good it's just that um, if you look for something that has the seal on it the VOHC uh, seal then you know it's gone through third-party studies that show that it does in fact reduce plaque um, with that being said, you know, you have to look at the list of products and see which are natural, which are not. Um, but Healthy Mouth is a more natural one. Um, and there's, uh, there's even, you know, recipes that you can make toothpaste. You just have to be careful with, um, you know, things you use. You wouldn't want to make something on your own without having, uh, you know, discussing it with your veterinarian and, and finding out to, you know, if it's okay to use. Um, but uh, there's another one that, um, there's one that's called Kissables. That's a, um, a toothpaste I've seen used, but there's so many, um, so many different kinds. I think, you know, we, we kind of stay with Healthy Mouth again because, you know, one, it is natural, and then two, it has that, the Veterinary Oral Health Council mm -hmm. studies behind it, which is nice because, you know, it can be hard sometimes um, to find natural products that also are backed by, uh, you know, other like the veterinary dentists and uh, specialists, all of that. So, um, so that's typically the one that I currently have been using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, there are, there are recipes, it's, you know, you may just not get as much of the benefits, but, you know, a big part of brushing is really kind of disrupting the biofilm that gets built, and that's where all these microbes can hide and, and proliferate. So, you know, the, the, you know, the biggest aspect of brushing teeth is the brushing part, but I know some of them, right. some of the toothpaste have enzymes in it that also will help to kind of decrease the, the biofilm, you know, break it down a little bit because the biofilm is whatever that stuff is in the morning, you know, and you go over your teeth and you have that slime. Um, that's the biofilm. So if you can disrupt that, you know, that's, that's good. Uh, and that can be done mechanically. Yeah, yeah. And, and certainly if, if there's an enzymatic process in the toothpaste, you know, that kind of helps with that, that works too, obviously. Right. right. So if, if you have not tolerate toothpaste, like you've tried different toothpaste and they, you know, they hate it, they just don't like the taste of it or whatever. I mean, 
use water and you're to in the toothbrush you know because that still is gonna again it's the mechanical action that's really the most important mm -hmm. um and and the toothpaste are just kind of you know again some of them will have some added things in them to help so mm -hmm. so uh, i know you i think you did cover that a little bit about the the number of you know the frequency of dental cleanings um you know that that really depends a little bit on the situation on the individual and such but you know ideally maybe once a year would be good just preventatively yeah so I, I would say once a year is pretty much to my general recommendation um if uh dependent on the animal you know i may recommend a little less than than a year like maybe 10 months or something um you know, a little sooner, or I may, if it's a larger breed dog and they haven't really had a, uh, you know, they're not predisposed, I may go a little longer. Again, you just, we do have to be aware to the age of the pet and also think about, you know, an oral exam. So we don't want to go so long that we can't, um, you know, get a good oral exam to make sure we're not finding anything that looks, uh, mm -hmm. looks like it's going to be, you know, a mass or anything. So, right. Right. All right. So maybe the last question, um, Becky asks, do you incorporate ozonated saline flushing of the tooth socket and gum lines during the cleaning or extractions to limit the use of antibiotics after cleanings and extractions? Well, let me talk about the ozone. We do have an ozone machine. And when I'm in the in the building <laughs> at the same time as the dental is happening, um, sometimes I, I pull it out, um, you know, if, if it looks like a dog could benefit from it, you know, if they have a really bad mouth, but uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the antibiotics because um, I think that's probably one area where a lot of change has happened in the last few years that may not have reached all the crevices of veterinary clinics. <laughs> so maybe if you could address that a little bit so that people can be a bit more educated on what's needed, what's not needed, when it's needed, or if it's yeah. ever needed at all. Um, you know, if you could maybe address that a little bit. Yeah, so actually, when that question came up, I had wanted to mention it earlier and I forgot. Um, so I actually rarely use antibiotics anymore. Um, and even, you know, the dental specialists now, uh, they, are not recommending antibiotics with extractions. Um, very select cases that we will use them on. So if I have uh, a patient who maybe is on immunosuppressive drugs because of a, another medical condition, those patients I would use an antibiotic in, um, although I love when Dr. Suter's there and has the ozone machine because we can, I, I love doing the, the flushes with the ozone, uh, ozonated saline, but, um, but I don't, I mean, unless it's a, you know, specific case, um, because if you're, you know, we do our dental cleanings, we clean everything out when I'm extracting, we clean out all the debris, we flush and flush. And so they're really, you know, the mouth is very forgiving with healing. Um, I definitely will say that the mouth is, you know, very forgiving. So, um, so I, yeah, I rarely use antibiotics. Um, Definitely, I don't send home antibiotics for cleanings, um, for regular cleanings, for extractions, I really don't either. I, I mean, dogs or cats. And if I have something that, and I think Dr. Suter, you'll agree with this, if I have something that looks like, you know, maybe um, it's not healing as well, um, I'll go to the colloidal silver um, and use that as a little bit of a rinse. And oftentimes that's all that I'll need. I mean, I've seen things heal up, you know, very well with that. So, um, so hopefully that is good news to all of you that, you know, we're uh, not using antibiotics the way we were uh, because I do remember getting out of vet school and that was pretty much every dental patient got antibiotics, you know, so, um, so we definitely are um, moving much away from that mm. and not just holistic practices, you know, again, it's the, the dental specialists rarely use them mm -hmm. yeah so that's something that's good to for you guys all to know uh, so you, you know when you go in for a dental you can request that your vet doesn't you know not that they wouldn't use antibiotics 
Um, so that's really good. What about um, those heart patients, you know, that have a little bit of pre-existing heart issues and antibiotics? Because I, I thought I read somewhere that even with that, they don't even recommend it anymore. It, although some of the, the cardiologists will still recommend it, I will still see it on the report. But then I read studies where they say, well, even with those, it's not really necessary. Yeah. I, I've um, read both things as well. Definitely the cardiologists will still generally recommend it. Um, I've talked to several dental specialists who don't uh, use it, even in some cases like that. So again, for me, it's really kind of a matter of a case by case basis um, for that. But we're finding that it may not be as uh, necessary as we thought. Um, so uh, I kind of, I don't do give a general uh, recommendation on that. I kind of base that on uh, individual mm -hmm. patient, you know, the severity of the heart issue or the severity of the dental disease or what we're going to be doing. You know, if I'm going to be cleaning everything, um, you know, mm -hmm. then I'm not uh, really that worried about it. So, yeah, yeah. Wow, I think we did the rounds here with everything that you wanted to talk about. Um, you know, I, I you got a lot of claps from from people about the whole antibiotic thing, and you know, I'm I have to say, you guys, I'm very lucky to have Dr. Doring take such good care of my patients um, because you know I always say, oh, please don't use that, or please, you know, or let's try this, you know, and. And we work really well together, so I'm I'm very very lucky, and you know also to have someone who is so knowledgeable <laughs> and and such a you know so good with with teeth and so thorough. It's just I mean uh, it just amazes me every time I see you at work. Although I always try to make a big circle around what you're doing because <laughs> I just hate seeing you know yeah you should see me at the dentist. I don't do well. <laughs> so anyways thank you so so much for um you know having come and, and joined me in this in this facebook live we've had quite a lot of people join here and and watch and it's been amazing so um where let me tell people how you know if you want to be reached how they can reach you <laughs> um yeah and, and it's awesome to see everybody here and all the interactions and questions and everything. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much uh, anybody can, you know, leave me a uh, message at the clinic at uh, the whole pet. So um, I'm there most days, four days a week, Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, well, now Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and uh you know, I know uh, you can either call uh, our number uh, there. We have our website is uh, TWP Vet. Uh, so you can reach me in that way. That's probably the easiest way to reach me. Um, and then if you have questions about anything or, you know, want to talk about getting anything set up, then we can talk about that or answer your questions. Yeah, and I'm here too, and you know, I can always answer some questions too, and I'm certainly going to go through the comments that were made and the questions a little bit um, and answer some of them for sure, because you guys have been quite prolific in, in answer, uh, you know, asking awesome questions. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to cover all of them. Um, so I'll definitely go through it, through them in the next few days. I can't promise to do that tonight <laughs> because I'm tired. Uh, but anyways, thank you so much, for you guys, for coming and, you know, being part of this Facebook Live. Um, you know, dental health and the health of the mouth is so important and near and dear to our hearts um, because we want your animals to live a very long life. So anyways, thank you so much, for everyone, for joining. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Doring, for joining us. And if you want more information, you also know where to find me. I posted some links. And um, if you're watching this, then you're, you can see where, where we're located <laughs> um, as far as Facebook is concerned. All right. So I wish all of you guys a, a great evening. And thanks again for joining. And we'll see you next time for some other subject. Feel free to post, you know, what you're interested in in the section as well.
um, and let me know what, what you'd like me to talk about. Um, so, anyways, thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Doring. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye everyone.